So collective narratives. Uh, my favorite quote in all of the social sciences, if I had to pick one, is this, from Clifford Geertz, paraphrasing Max Weber. Man is an animal suspended in webs of significance that he himself has spun. That's what social life is. We kind of make it up and then we live in it. And uh, many of you will recognize this is essentially what William Gibson was doing when he created those books and then the movies about the Matrix. The Matrix, he said, is a consensual hallucination. Now, as a social scientist, as a social psychologist, this is just beautiful because this is what we study is how do we hallucinate this? And then why does it have such a grip on us? But it does. Um, when I moved to the business school at, at uh, NYU um, in 2011, I had no interest in business. I just wanted to be in New York City um, to promote the righteous mind. But I began learning about capitalism. I'd known nothing about it before, practically. I began learning about capitalism in business, and I discovered that there are two very, very different stories being told. There's the one which is dominant in most of the university and on Occupy Wall Street about capitalism is basically exploitation. And then there's the one I was learning in the business school, and, and uh, I read a history of capitalism about, no, capitalism is, is liberation. It's value creation. And I got, was fascinated by these because both are formed into totally cohesive, self-contained narratives that are demonstrably true. All you have to do is look at the newspaper and you can see how true this story is. But they're two different incompatible stories. And over time, I sort of animated these into a PowerPoint talk and then I hired somebody to turn that into a video. So I'm gonna show you now two 90 second videos. Um, just before we start, please what you do is so reach into your head, set your uh, switches, um, turn your care and fairness settings up to 11 please. And if you have a systemizing switch, turn that down to three. Okay, got it? All right, roll the video, please. All right, or maybe I do it by here, let's see. Once upon a time, work was real and authentic. Farmers raised crops, and craftsmen made goods with their own hands. <coughs> but then, capitalism was invented, and darkness spread across the land as the smokestacks of the Industrial Revolution covered everything in soot. The capitalists became ever more skilled at extracting productivity from workers and pocketing the gains from their labor. The workers eventually fought back by unionizing. In the early 20th century, as the brutality and stupidity of capitalism were exposed, many governments granted workers some protection <coughs> from the creditors. Democratic welfare states were born. But the capitalists and their right-wing cronies were unrelenting. And in many countries, they have destroyed the unions slashed regulations, and given the corporations free reign to exploit at will. So, the rich get richer, the rest of us get poorer, our democracy gets weaker, and the planet gets hotter. It is now the duty of every decent person to join the fight against global capitalism and the super predators it has unleashed upon us. Okay, so that's a coherent story. It has a once upon a time, it has a clear villain, it has a trajectory, and it tells you what we need to do. Now I'll show you the second story, and what I want you to note is it's exactly the same structure. I literally wrote out a table of two columns and certain slots. I just plugged in different content, but it's the same structure. Oh, uh, and before you watch, please turn your liberty and systemizing up to 11, and turn care and empathizing down to three. Enjoy the show. Once upon a time, almost everyone was a peasant, a serf, or a slave. Kings and feudal lords took most of what people produced, so nobody had much reason to work hard. But then in the 17th century, capitalism was invented and the liberation began. In England, Holland, and America, they discovered that when you give people property rights, the rule of law, and free markets, you turn on a switch in their hearts. People want to work when they can keep the fruits of their labor. They want to invent new products, provide for their children, and be useful to others. Free market capitalism enables them to do these things. In the 20th century, some countries embraced communism and centralized planning, always with the same result. Shortages of everything, including food and freedom. But countries that embraced capitalism have grown prosperous in a single generation. Yet, despite the evidence of history, the left-wing egalitarians are unrelenting, and whenever they get control of a government, their first target is economic freedom. The egalitarians don't want to live in a world in which people who create more value for others get to enjoy more wealth for themselves. They'd rather that everyone be equal and equally poor. 
It is now the duty of every decent person to join the fight to protect capitalism and to extend its blessings to all of humankind. Okay, well, I could take a vote on which one uh, you prefer, but I think that's probably not necessary. Um, all right, so if there are these two coherent stories that are organizing political groups, political parties, um, well, not necessarily parties, but if there are these coherent stories out there, what do we do? Is there a way forward? Um, do we need a third story? Uh, I'm not sure what the answer is to that, but I think that it's important for all of us to recognize that both of these stories actually have a lot of truth to them. Even if you, even if you prefer one, the other one does have some real truth to it. What I'm finding is I'm, I'm traveling around many countries, I'm writing a book on morality and capitalism, and I'm finding that across countries, the left generally stands for decency even at the cost of dynamism, and the right generally stands for dynamism even at the cost of decency. Um, and so just from the last couple days while I was preparing this talk, um, American capitalism, uh, uh, has, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of humiliation, there is a lot of suffering, there are a lot of people who fall through the cracks. Uh, certainly from a European perspective, we have embraced dynamism to the point of ignoring uh, decency. This was just this morning on the plane down. I, uh, you know, a new, all these leaks going on, some very clear examples in Wisconsin of exactly how corporations bought legislation. So there's a lot of truth to that first story. Um, uh, and so I understand why they say, look, we, you know, if you just have unbridled freedom, this is what you get, is this kind of corruption. This is why we need to enforce, we need to get more equality. I understand that. Um, but I also came across, while preparing this talk, this quote from Milton Friedman. A society that aims for equality before liberty will end up with neither equality nor liberty. Uh, it always ends up, when the initial efforts to, force a, to create equality don't work, they end up pushing harder and harder and harder. And a society that aims first for liberty will not end up with equality, but it will end up with a closer approach to equality than any other kind of system that has ever been developed. So I think it's certainly worth at least uh, uh, meditating on that. It seems like it is true to me. Um, so what can we do so that we don't have this eternal groundhog day of recurrence of bad economic thinking? I have four suggestions. The first is, boy, it sure would help if we could reduce the role of money in politics and make that first story less true about how uh, power and legislation happen in this country. Uh, second, I've been reading Yuval Levin's uh, wonderful uh, book, Fractured Republic, and I'm now a big fan, not just of his, but of, his, of the importance of subsidiarity, of having things dealt with at the lowest level possible, not kicking it up to the federal government, which is, has a terrible record of solving problems. So subsidiarity combined with a general orientation towards experimentation. Let's try a program. And if it really does undermine incent have perverse incentives, we'll know it and then we'll stop. We won't just roll it out to the whole country. So subsidiarity plus experimentalism as, as the way to deal with social problems, I think, would give us much better economic, uh, econo economically sound uh, policy and uh, programs. Third, if I were, uh, if I were king and uh, there were no constitutional limits on what I could do, I would uh, reduce the amount of math we make kids learn. It's a kind of a 19th century idea that if we make them exercise their brain on this, they'll get smarter. It's not true. Even scientists don't generally need that much math. What we need is a populace that is literate in analytical thinking. And so a year of statistics and a year of economics would do wonders for economic thinking, as we saw in, uh, in John's example of a single economics course as an undergraduate. Um, uh, my fourth suggestion is that I think we need to increase viewpoint diversity in the academy. Um, as we've heard, the, uh, uh, there's a kind of a, a very much pro-socialist way of thinking in most department, in many departments at universities. Uh, we need to expose students to at least a variety of ways of thinking. This graph shows how the academy has changed uh, in the last uh, 20 or 30 years. The left-right ratio used to be just two to one. As late as 1996, if a representative sample of all professors, in 1996, the blue line on top is people who said they were on the left, only twice as many people on the left as the right. And that's fine with me. I don't care about equality. I just want to make sure that if someone says something from a leftist or rightist perspective, someone out there will challenge it. That's what I want. Um, but over the next 15 years, things had changed. Now it's five to one. And most of the non-leftists there are in engineering schools or dental schools. If you look at the core areas of the humanities and social scientists, it's between 10 to 1 and 50 to 1, left to right. That's why um, I and some other colleagues started an organization called Heterodox Academy. Lita and John are members. And any professors who are out there watching this talk, I urge you to go to heterodoxacademy.org and join. Uh, we're just trying to say, 
Diversity is good. Shouldn't we have diversity of thinking? <clears throat> so um, if we can do those things, I think and hope that we will have at least a little less foolishness going forward. Thank you. <laughs>